Ladies and gentlemen and dear guests, a very warm welcome to today's New Year's lecture on behalf of the University of Bayreuth. The last year has been exciting, dramatic and it has shocked us in many moments. Nevertheless, or perhaps precisely because of that, we are looking to the future with a motivation and with hope and we are pushing ahead with internationalization and diversification. In the internationalization strategy, this can be found above all in the areas of cosmopolitan campus and global networks. As University of Bayreuth, we understand open-mindedness, especially in these times, as a core element of the university's global profile. Today, you're dealing with 10 challenges for reconfigurating African studies. And these 10 challenges include genealogical, epistemic, linguistic, chronological and theoretical aspects. This is a wide range. At the heart of the reconfiguration of African studies is the imperative of decolonization, the recognition of Africa as a legitimate site of knowledge, production and rethinking African studies. But if you look carefully at the global affairs today, you will see that they are partly moving in the opposite direction. New powers are taking foothold in African territory, taking over knowledge, resources and culture. Massive direct investments lead to financial dependencies and some see this as nothing more than a new form of colonization. And the democratic part of the world defends values on African soil that it partly brought there itself. In 1986, the African Charter on Humans and People's Rights came into force. Of all human rights treaties, it has the greatest diversity of rights. With 53 signatory states, the Charter is the largest regional human rights protection regime in the world. But the status of the implementation and the enforcement is still fragmentary. Another example, the Nagoya Protocol. It is also proof of how science is trying to take a responsible path together with Africa. Making such a self-commitment poses enormous administrative challenges, yet it is the right thing to do. The vast majority of states in Africa have ratified the protocol and therefore many of you already deal with its standards during your research. An endeavor like yours today, the New Year's Lecture, with a topic like this, fits right into these efforts. That you, as scientists, are looking for a new, responsible, intellectual and academic working relationship between Africanists and African scholars honors you, and for this I wish you every success. Can you hear me now? Wonderful, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I uh, have a pleasant holiday season, whether you celebrate Christmas or not. Please accept my best wishes for a happy new year. Hopefully, a year of health, conviviality, community, and productivity for all of us. It is to introduce this year's speaker for Proctor's New Year Lecture 2023. This is now. Sabello J. Govo Gacchini, Professor and Chair of the of the Global South with emphasis on Africa and the first Dean of Research in the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. In addition to these demanding positions here at the University of Bayreuth, Gacchini is Professor Extraordinary in the Department of Leadership and Transformation in the Principal and Vice Chancellor's Office at the University of South Africa, and studies at the University of Free State in South Africa. And I have to admit, this is my personal favorite, given the immense research potential between the transdisciplinary fields of gender studies and African studies, as is evidenced by the scholars feminist and gender studies scholars as African queer studies scholars. He is also in the School of Education at the University of Kuala Natal in South Africa. He is also an associate at the Department of Political Science at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He is also a research associate at the Ferguson Center for African and Asian Studies at the Open University in the United Kingdom. Previously, Professor Ndlova Mungachini 
research professor and director of scholarship at the Department of Leadership and Transformation in the Principal and Chancellor's Office at the University of South Africa. He is also the founding head of the RT Mafeji Research Institute for Applied Social Policy at the University of South Africa. He is also the founder of the Africa Decolonial Research Network based at the University of South Africa, and he founded this in 2011, and a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Professor Ngachini has over 100 publications, including over 20 books to his name. His latest publications include State Freedom in Africa, Deprovincialization and Decolonization, published with Rutledge in 2018. Uh, so Marxism and Decolonization in the 21st Century, Living Theories and True Ideas, again published with Rutledge 2022. The from the Global South, Beyond the Coloniality of Internationalism. This is in the Cadestria book series and it is under review. As is apparent from the aforementioned publications, Professor Andlovo Ngacini is a most prolific scholar of decolonial theory. Doing decolonial scholarship in the transdisciplinary field of African studies requires persistence and vocabularies of vision. While addressing the uncomfortable questions are other ways knowledge about Africa has been produced and circulated, and by whom. The coloniality of power is writ large in knowledge production practices, perspectives, and politics is not a secret. Indeed, the dynamics of power in institutional hierarchies is one of the many aspects that Professor Dlovu Gacheni cogently addresses in his works, laid out in clear and to the point language. From his own disciplinary locus of enunciation in history, Professor Dlovu Gacheni approaches his tasks in addressing necessary diachronic and synchronic aspects of African studies with a view to eliciting much needed reflection and change. Among the many agendas he addresses in his research and teaching, Professor Ndlovo Gacchini considers the genealogies of knowledge production, taking a specifically critical gaze on colonial history, which has done much in shaping African studies, promoting ideas of Africa predominantly from global North perspectives, simultaneously unearthing and validating African knowledge archives relevant with indigenous knowledge perspectives and politics necessary for the reimagining of African studies from African worldviews. The interrogations of colonial European and African epistemic monuments of history might cause discomfort. Nevertheless, Professor Ndlovo Ngocini's scholarship the necessity of critically revisiting established knowledge production practices and contexts in order to envision modes of African futurity imagined and lived from African perspectives, histories and knowledges in all their multiplicity and complexity. And here I am reminded of feminist cultural studies scholar Sam Ahmed's observation in her seminal 2000 article in the Affect Studies Reader when she unequivocally states, a concern with histories that hurt is not then a backward orientation. To move on, you must make this return, unquote. While well, there's so much more to be said about Professor Ndlova Gacchini's work, I want to briefly pick out two aspects among the many things I have learned from him, which have held my attention while working with him. One particular feature <clears throat> is his mapping out decolonial visions for African studies in the 10 Ds of decolonization, which he tabulated in his 2020 publication with Third World Quarterly, The Cognitive Empire, Politics of Knowledge and African Intellectual Productions. These potential methodological trajectories, interestingly enough, mobilize critical diversity principles as set out by South African critical diversity study scholar, Melissa Sten in her 2015 publication on critical diversity literacy in the Handbook of Diversity Studies. These principles involve considering institutional hierarchies, power relations, historicization, contextualization, and positionalities. And they are implicit in the 10 Ds, which they themselves would merit a couple of PhD theses. So while the integration of decolonial approaches into African studies might seem daunting for many, and it is daunting to me, I see these 
attendees as impressive pragmatic mappings towards rethinking and reconfiguring African studies. A second aspect that caught my attention while working with Professor Ndlovo Gacheni these last couple of years is his epistemic and work mantra of building a community of practice across status groups, reflecting on our loci of enunciation, recognizing that we are products of the knowledge production systems and contexts we have been epistemically socialized into, learning to listen, opening ourselves up to possible knowledges, manifesting in forms other than that of established canonical knowledge production norms. Part of Professor Ndlova Gacchini's premise towards the formation of such a community is that of decolonial love, which he describes as, I quote, a new ethics of living together, economies of care, a politics of conviviality, and hospitality as opposed to enmity. Unquote. In his, this is in his two, uh, uh, 2020 essay on the geopolitics of power and knowledge in the COVID-19 pandemic, published in the Journal of Developing Societies. In my attempts to get a pragmatic handle on Professor Ndlova Gacchini's notion of affective, gendered, interpersonal, relational aspects of care can be integrated into decolonial epistemic practices. Remnances of this reasoning in the work of the late African-American feminist cultural studies and media studies scholar, Bell Hawkes, who observes embracing a love ethic means we utilize all the dimensions of love, care, commitment, trust, responsibility, respect, and knowledge in our everyday lives. We can successfully do this only by cultivating awareness. Being aware enables us to critically examine our actions to see what is needed so that we can give care, be responsible, show respect, and indicate a willingness to learn. Cultivating such awareness requires us to imagine worlds that transgress the current one we have. To embrace the notion that new worlds can be imagined through theory and education, but also that such work is hard and uncomfortable. Indeed, I read Professor Ndlov Gacchini's works on epistemic freedom and decolonization as an example of Bell Hooks's radical idea that, a quote, theory can be a healing practice, sorry, a healing place, as she states in her seminal 1994 work, Teaching to Transgress. The idea of such awareness in forming a community of practice might be a puzzling and indeed challenging enterprise to many for whom knowledge production is often conceived of as insular, individualistic, isolated modes of endeavor, leading to interesting ideas of silo thinking, specialization. I see this as a necessary epistemic parameter in envisioning, in envisioning this cluster as a research community of practice in working towards African studies, uh, reconfiguring African studies in the frame of doing African studies with African scholars from the continent and from the diasporas. Sabelo, I look forward to explore much of these decolonial trajectories with you. And so without further ado, dear colleague, I hand over this space to you. I look forward to learning from your teachings and having those necessary conversations. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Christine, for the generous introduction and the greetings to all of you. It is really a pleasure to see so many of you here, those who are physically here and those who are actually present in the virtual space. It's a happy new year. And I don't think I need to do the protocols. I'm not all that great with that. Uh, but uh, can observe the, the dean of the cluster, the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence. She is here. The members of the management board of the cluster are also here. And they also, this lecture was not going to be possible if it was not for the support of my wife, who is also here, 
uh, um, for the first time, I will try to project something. Uh, I always take knowledge very politically. And because of that, I want to argue issues rather than to project them. But I will project for the first time, maybe for the last time as well. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to, to read, to try to read, because I'm not very good in reading, uh, as an introduction to what we're going to do today. I want to try to read the issues which I think made me to think the way I think, the way I formulated this topic about the 10, the 10 um, challenges in reconfiguring African studies. And I must say that when I was based in South Africa, when I was based in Zimbabwe, I never thought of myself as doing African studies. It was only when I came here that I decided also to think about what is African studies. That's one. Two, it was when I joined here that I also began to reflect on what is reconfiguring African studies. When I was in South Africa, I was thinking more about decolonizing African studies, not reconfiguring African studies. So this um, lecture is also a journey which is a reflection from me on what is African studies, but at the same time also seeking to understand what does it mean to reconfigure African studies. So allow me to begin, and I will begin by reading, then I will then project. I think one issue for certain is that um, the beauty of Africa lies in its plurality, in its diversity, and in its multiplicity. Some call it bewildering diversity. Diversity uh, which comes in the following ways. It is a continent with 54 states. It is a continent with at least seven time zones. It is a continent with between 2,500 to 3,000 languages. It is a continent at least with uh, seven climates. It is a continent with almost a billion inhabitants. Professor Tandika Mkandawire also added another element. It is a continent with 14 million not mutually consistent proverbs. That is Africa. And perhaps it is this diversity and the plurality that make African studies exist as an attraction in the first instance. And secondly, as a site of struggles and contestations. And today, I will try to reflect on those contestations. And the contestations begin with the very difficult definition of what is Africa. The idea of Africa itself is not just an idea that is not given to precision and the easy definition, but it is in the words of Tandika Mkandawire, a real and a tangible social existence that validates it as an area of social study. But as a young field of study, African studies, its meanings and the conceptions are hard to settle. Also, as a young field of study, it has diverse gen genesis and the genealogies. And these continue to attract research and the contestations. I must not even forget about the fact that at the center of the African studies is the colonial package and the role of the colonial library, which continue to complicate and to haunt African studies. The complex questions of epistemology, methodology, and the theory continue to raise animated debate in African studies. There is also the sociology and the politics of knowledge, which preoccupy the minds of both Africanists and African scholars. 
raising issues within this very university, raising issues of scientific scholarship that is neutral, objective versus ideologically driven scholarship that is political and subjective. Then there are special issues in, Afri in, in African studies, the special issues of area studies, country studies, continental diasporic divisions, which continue also to define the parameters of African studies. Then of course, we cannot ignore the power knowledge dynamics reflective of the broader global economy of knowledge, which produce and reproduce an even intellectual and academic division of labor. Then of course, during the time we are living in, there is resurgent and a insurgent decolonization imperative. And this imperative has invoked a reopening of the basic existential and epistemological questions in African studies. And of course, there is still yet more. The gender analysis and the feminist scholarship has not yet been fully integrated into African studies practices. And of course, here we debate endlessly this resourcing of African studies, which we call funding of research. And it manifests what Shose Kesi, Zoe Marx, and Elelone Ramagudu termed the pervasive structural coloniality in African studies. Then, of course, Martin and the West, they alerted us to what they called the resilient and the hegemonic Africanist enterprise, which continues to reproduce itself in African studies. In short, what brings us here today is a field whose past, the present, and the future are mediated by struggles and contestations. And I will actually try to share with you some of them. And I think they actually sit at the center of the whole agenda of reconfiguring African studies. <clears throat> Oh, it's so small, I can't even read. <laughs> Is this supposed to be like that? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I never wanted to thank those who, who invited me to give the lecture because they gave me sleepless nights during a festive season. So I thought it was more of a punishment than anything. <clears throat> but what I will try to do, I will try to reflect on, on the overarching vision of reconfiguring African studies. I will try also to distill a few matters arising as I think about reconfiguring African studies. Then I turn to the center of the, the lecture, which is the delineation and the reflection on the 10 challenges confronting and uh, reconfiguring African studies, then I will conclude. I hope I will do this in, in less than an hour. <clears throat> the question of reconfiguring African studies, as we all know, is actually the overarching agenda of the African Multiple Cluster of Excellence. And what I found out as I was checking, I went back to the to the application itself. And I went back to the second, or was it the first uh, New Year lecture by the founding dean, uh, Professor Zizman. And they eat in those two documents, I then, if I'm right, I found that there are two core issues which are constitutive of the reconfiguring African studies. The first is the structural, and the second is the conceptual. And in the conceptual, maybe before I even do that, I think what emerges clearly, I thought I will go to a document where I will find really a clear definition of what reconfiguring African studies is, and also the task of what, what do we do to reconfigure African studies. 
But what I found out is that this group, which constitute the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence, they were clever enough to define the whole issue of uh, reconfiguring African studies as a research agenda in itself. So it looks like when uh, the founding dean was talking about figuring out how to configure African studies, he was actually setting an agenda to, for continuous thinking about what reconfiguring African studies is. But of course, the idea was that there is clearly two levels of intervention, the structural level in which the agenda is to, to deal with the structural setup of African studies, including the hierarchies, the distribution of resources, and the organization of research infrastructure. And this was an agenda which was identified from here in Bayreuth before the establishment of the Africa, the Africa centers. And it is interesting that even the thinkers from the continent, they agree that there is need to intervene at that level, which is the structural level. And that comes clearly from Shose Kesi, Zoe Marx, and Eleloane Ramagudu when they also speak about structural decolonizing. And they go on to talk about distributing, redistributing, reopening material resources and opportunities, institutions, jobs, titles, professional recognition, research budgets, leadership, and the gatekeeping roles, scholarships, and the entries of admission that are currently distributed in ways that anchor and reproduce the colonial relations. And then coming to the second agenda, the second agenda is really the most difficult. And I think the lecture today will actually focus more on that rather than the structural. And in that conceptual agenda, the idea was that we'll develop new conceptual frameworks capable of addressing the shortcomings of previous approaches. And some of the issues which were identified was the very conception of African studies, the area studies, the package in African studies, the colonial package. And they, of course, that all these will require decolonizing. And again, there seem to be a convergence of that agenda with what some African scholars are thinking, particularly Kesi et al, whereby they speak about the issue of epistemic decolonizing, which is about redemption of worldviews and the theories and the ways of knowing that are rooted in or oriented around Euro-American theory. And of course, another senior African scholar, Chris Pra from Ghana, but who is based in South Africa, he spoke eloquently about that this agenda is the most intimidating. It is the intimidating question. Uh, it intimidates not only the Africanists, but it also intimidates African scholars themselves. But now I begin to enter into some of the issues which I think are very important as we think about reconfiguring African studies, what I called the emerging issues. Uh, and one of the issues which I, for lack of a better term, I called the Hescovician ghost. Uh, from Meville Hescovitz, who, when he became the first uh, president of the African Studies Association, presented this argument that African studies needs to be objective, need to be scientific, there needs to be detachment. And he argued that this will be possible for American-based scholars because one, the US had no colonies in Africa, so it is not embedded in the, in the, in the colonial package. Two, that uh, because of distance, they are thinking they are from America coming into Africa, so they will be detached. They won't be embedded in the issues. Uh, <clears throat> and the, and the three, because of that detachment, they will be objective. And the four, they will be scientific. And we have such debates here within the cluster about this issue, 
of uh, those who pursue scientific scholarship versus those who, who pursue ideologically driven scholarship. And I think it's not a small debate. It is a debate which actually takes us to the basic epistemological questions. Hence, the importance of this slide, which really raises the basic epistemological questions and they also moves on to how have they been approached uh, in mainstream thinking? And how are, we, are they being rethought in decolonial and postcolonial thinking? So I put them there in terms of where does knowledge come from? What is the role of identity in knowledge? Is there any role of identity in knowledge? Does knowledge have a geography? Is there any role of biography and experience in knowledge? What is the role of ideology since they are talking about ideologically driven knowledge? What is the role of ideology in knowledge? And perhaps you can add, what is the role of the question of time in knowledge? Um, <clears throat> and I tried in the second column to then say, these are the previous notions of uh, uh, responses to this. Uh, the idea that uh, we need to be careful about identity. Identity tends to lead to, subject, uh, to subjectivity and uh, therefore it undercuts objectivity and, uh, and uh, being scientific. And uh, therefore it needs to be a backgrounded rather than projected. And then the idea of geography that no, but for valid knowledge, Valid knowledge must actually be valid across space time and it must be universal. And when it comes to biography and experience again, that the issues of objectivity, impartiality and detachment and the disinterest needs to be maintained. And when it comes to ideology, that when we produce knowledge, when we want to be truthful, we need to be neutral. So those, even myself, when I was trained as a historian, those were the values which were inculcated in me. And in history, particularly, we were not allowed to say I or we. It was assumed that once you do that, you are very subjective. In other words, you must pretend to be absent when you are present. And that is what we are trying to run away from now. We want now to say we are present. We are not absent when we, we produce knowledge. So this is why you will find when it comes now to decolonial and postcolonial thinking, they bring in the issue of eco-politics of knowledge. They bring in the issue of geopolitics of knowledge. They bring in the issue of body politics of knowledge and embodied knowledges. Of course, across even the previous uh, <clears throat> conceptions of knowledge. The idea that knowledge is political, I think is accepted across board. It, it, it is accepted across board. But these are the issues which, which I think, when we're thinking about reconfiguring African studies, we need to go back to those basic questions. I think they are very, they are very important. Uh, of course, we cannot offer the answers, but we need not to run away from them because one issue for certain, for me to stand up and claim that I'm scientific, I'm objective. The only claim, the only basis of that claim is that I will hide who I am. But who I am is always in me. So I, I think it's better to put them on the table. And the difference between those who, who claim to be pursuing scientific elite driven knowledge and objectivity, is only that they are more successful in hiding their identities. Whereas some of us, we decide to be truthful. I am Savelo I am black, I am male, I'm from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was colonized and I'm not happy about it. But before I move on, I thought, why I did not focus more on the structural issues. I think even in the, in the, in the proposal for the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence, it looks like 
there was a clear thinking on the structural issues. It looks like the structures have been put in place. Uh, whether they are working well is another question, but the structures are there. Uh, the biggest achievement being the establishment of the Africa cluster centers. Uh, they are there now. So I think if we, as an as a, as a, as a Africa multiple cluster of excellence, if there is something to show, is that structurally we did something. <laughs> we, we did something. So that is there. Whether it works well or not, that's another question, but it is there. So I thought that one, uh, we have the, the, the ACCs, we have the knowledge lab, we have the junior research groups, we have the research sections, we have gender diversity office, we have the digital research platform, all that is there structurally. So one of the promises which were made, I think it is in that area that we have fulfilled a few of them. But I wanted also to argue that the very establishment of the ACCs actually brings another challenge. The proposal was made by Africanists, if I can put it that way. And by then, when they were putting the proposal, the African-based scholars were not part of the job. And now they are there. Now we have the ACCs. So it means, therefore, the next task is a relational task. The Africanists and the African scholars coming together. Of course, there are matters arising in between that. And it is only then that I thought, Kesi, Zoe, and Erolwane, they were right that when we are thinking about decolonizing, we need also to think about relational aspects. And this issue of some doing scientifically driven scholarship, uh, which is objective, and this issue that others are doing ideologically driven, is part of relationality which we need to sort, which we need to think, we need to find each other across those two, whether you call them camps or something like that. So I think that's one issue which is, which is re-emerging. And then the other issue which I thought is emerging clearly is the issue of redefinition and reconceptualizing of African studies. And I thought, I read a bit during the Christmas and the, and the, the New Year period and trying to understand what does it, what will it entail to redefine and reconceptualize African studies? Because we put it clearly as one of the agendas. And it fundamentally therefore means we need to think really about a working definition of African studies. What, what do we mean by African studies from where we stand here? Um, Christopher Clapham, who is not my favorite scholar, but I think he raised an important issue when he was saying, when we are thinking about decolonizing African studies, we need, first of all, to define African studies maybe at two levels. The first level being, do, are you thinking about African studies as an organized intellectual inquiry, which is institutionalized? Or are you thinking about African studies from the basis of concerns? What is it concerned about? So, so I, I thought that was that that can give us a bit of an idea in order to think about how do we define African studies here, and 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 that that question also arises in the work of Kesi and her colleagues, where he says African studies is an interdisciplinary knowledge production concerning Africa or Africans, and it entails scholarship in with for, of, on, and from Africa and the African studies. And he emphasizes this issue of Africa and the Africans at the center of African studies. And I think we are struggling with putting that, what does it mean to put Africans at the center of African studies? And that is also highlighted by Rene Odenga who says, whether we are thinking about the field of African studies, this history, its methodology, 
whether we are thinking about the sociocultural utility, basically we are thinking about the African, which is the, which is the subject of the study. And I think it is important that we reflect on that in our reconfiguring African studies. And we need to have serious debates. What do we mean by African studies? And they, beginning to think about that, I began to think about what is really at the center of African studies, if you think about it from the perspective of the concerns. And I thought the concerns which we need to take into account are the existential, the epistemological, and the injustice issues. How do we put them at the center of African studies? And they, I thought if we redefine African studies in the context of existential, epistemological and injustice issues, we are beginning to reconfigure African studies away from its genealogy in, in colonial and area studies. We begin to reconnect African studies with struggles of black people, African people, African feminist struggles against racism, enslavement, colonialism, imperialism, racial capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. And in thinking this way, I was working uh, <clears throat> with the two uh, uh, feminist scholars, Slivia Timale and Natalie Toke. Timale poses this question, which I think we need to take very seriously. And this is the question where she says, who will connect the ideological dots of racism, colonialism, capitalism, sexism, and the heteropatriarchy in ways that our children understand? And the whole work of decolonizing at the center of it is that task of connecting the dots of racism, colonialism, capitalism, sexism, heterosexism in ways that our children can understand. And this becomes important within a context in which there are knowledges for concealment of injustices. And there are knowledges for revelation. And we need to be careful which ones are we pursuing. We cannot use this idea of being scientific, being objective in order to pursue knowledge of concealment we will need really to deal with the knowledge of revelation. Uh, these issues of racism, colonialism, capitalism, sexism, and heterosexism uh, are very important and they cannot be hidden under, under, under the banner of being scientific and being objective. And this is not only a pattern in my heart and mind, it is also a pattern in the, in the, in the, in the other African thinkers. For instance, Natalie Etoke put it even more forcefully when he says, in a world where thought closes itself in language that strives to erase the sensitivity of existence, how can we make sense of sub-Saharan of Afro-diasporic life experiences rooted in suffering, born of social, economic, cultural, historical structures, dominated by unequal power relations. How can we examine the encounter with the other? How can we understand a path towards freedom forged through pain inflicted on the body, pain that penetrated the soul? How can we describe a subjectivity in which self-destruction and the reconstruction arise from the traumatic experience? People who were excluded from the universal family must face these questions. And I think that's an important uh, question. And she then proceeds, which I find even more interesting, when he says, my process breaks with the habits that will have me speak of myself and the mind as if I spoke of another. Step out of myself for the sake of objectivity. Regurgitate the other's ways of thinking in other's rhetoric that I have learnedly digested. In all frankness, I take the risk of injecting subjectivity into my words. And I think that is an important aspect to take as we 
think about reconfiguring African studies. And when I became a little bit circled here at the beginning of this year, I then started the seminar series, The Changing African Idea of Africa and the Future of African Studies. Because every time I tried to think about African studies, the question of what is Africa always haunted me. So I thought it would be important to have this series where we meet, think very deeply about the African idea of Africa as it impinges, as it is at the center of African studies. Of course, a lot of scholars are familiar with the, the work of Valentin Waimutimbe, the African idea of Africa, as well as the invasion of Africa. But there is increasing idea that we need to move. We need to progress beyond that. And the modes of progressing beyond that is that we begin to think about the African idea of Africa, not simply the idea of Africa, whereby Africa is thought from outside. And that those seminar series which I started were an attempt to begin to do that and to be a mechanism to do that. And we had Achille opening them in April 2022 on the theme of Africa in theory. And he emphasized that when we want to reconfigure African studies, when we want to rethink Africa, we need to take into account the long durée of or the deep histories of Africa before colonialism. And when we're thinking about the African idea of Africa as a departure point in African studies, we're actually also thinking about this African search for self-invention, self-definition, self-determination, self-writing, and uh, remembering. It's reading this Otenga, the young man, the young scholar, who was saying, every time somebody raises the question of African agency, I get very frustrated because when he says African agency, and he wants us to focus on that, he's fundamentally saying Africans are not people. Because if they are people, obviously, it is obvious that they have agents. You can't, it can't be something which is said for that, do they have agency? If they are human beings, they have agents. And it, I also began to read the, the latest literature which is being published. And one of them is by Achil Mbembe and the fellow in Sa, The Politics of Time imagining African becomings, which also emphasize the issue that let's make Africa the departure point so that we seize hold of any options in the future. And I think in the third, was it the third new lecture by uh, Professor Peter Semate Krilop from uh, the Imoi ACC was beginning also to say, let's move. Let's think about ways of knowing Africa and the shifting imaginaries. So I'm building on that to, to, to present what I'm presenting today. And what I'm presenting today, the focal point is really on these 10 issues. And nobody must ask me why 10, not three. Why 10, not 20. So these are the issues which I decided to focus on. I regretted when I tried now to look at one of them because it drained a lot of energy from me. Uh, so the first one, I thought it would be important for us to reflect on the genealogies and the, the genesis of African studies. Uh, the second one, I thought it would be important for us as we think about reconfiguring African studies to think about the epistemic questions. Uh, the third one is to think about the linguistic question. The fourth one, this one now I'm, so, I'm selling out, now I'm revealing that I'm a historian, the chronological question. And then the fifth one, the theoretical empirical questions. And the sixth one, we have going to have a conference here on spatialities thing. And I think it will be important to also think about spatiality as, a, as, a, as, a, as an aspect in African studies. And then of course, the long standing problem of androcentricity in African studies and the, as well as the disciplinary uh, <clears throat> dominance in African studies, you know, disciplinary fundamentalism, people who want to be in African studies, but they want also to 
to be permanently dwelling wherever they came from. And then the ninth is the canon, the question of the canon in African studies. And of course, that one is linked to the question of the colonial library. So that's what I will quickly do. And then I will sit down. The, the, the first one on the genesis and the genealogies of African studies, I think it would be important that how do we shift from the colonial genealogies? There's a lot of work being done about, so as a, a lot of work being done about the, the, the African Studies Association 1957 uh, and the, all the problems which cascaded from that, which created the, what, uh, what Martin and the, and the West call the, the Africanist enterprise. But the question is, how do we shift from that? I think we can do it very easily by actually thinking about other genealogies, pluralizing the genealogies of African studies. It's not a singular genealogies, it's not a singular genesis. There are various um, um, <clears throat> genealogies and the genesis of African studies. But the one which is dominant, which comes from the Africanist enterprise, tends to displace the other, the other genealogies of African yeah. studies. So I was thinking if we link it with the, red, the black radical tradition, what do we gain? If we begin to think about it, even from the continent, think about it from Legon, think about it from Ibadan, think about it from Dakar, think about it from Dar es Salaam, think about it from Maputo, think about it from Cairo, Makerere, Lumbumbashi, what will we gain if we think about it that way? And of course, Ali Mazuri was already beginning to indicate that it's possible to shift the genealogies and the genesis of African studies by looking at their genesis in Africa itself, where he talks about the genesis of African studies in the birthplace of the study of African civilization in Egypt. And he also links it with the work of the, the chronicles of uh, Abu Abdallah Mohammed Ibn Batuta. So he begins to say there are genealogies of African studies in Africa itself, and they, we need to, to do that. So what I'm doing is really sort of a mapping of what we can do practically. Uh, then secondly, the most difficult even for me is the epistemic question in African studies. And that one also, it needs us to revisit the work of African thinkers themselves, like Viva Imudimbe. Of course, a lot of us, uh, particularly from the Anglophone, we, we received Imudimbe through the invention of Africa and the idea of Africa, because that was what was published in English. This one, uh, I only got it now, uh, because it was published recently. It was published in 1982 in French, but it only pub published in English now. And that's where he started the whole issue of thinking about uh, the issue of the epistemic question in African studies. And he was really uh, thinking between two, two, two realities. One was the, re the colonial reality of the colonial structure. And at the same time, he was also thinking within a context of decolonization which was the search for uh, the recovery of African knowledges. And of course, uh, what comes out of Mdimbe is that he, if you read him carefully, you, you end up seeing, seeing no, no way out of the colonial library. But I think there is a way out of colonial library as long as colonialism had an intention, but it did not achieve all its objectives. It means there are, there are spaces in which it was not successful and we need to think from those. Then the third, I will move a bit fast. The third is the question of theory and empiricism, bifurcation in African studies. And I see this on a daily basis here uh, with the, the research which we do whereby the data is gathered from Africa, the theory, we search for it in America and also in Europe. And I think it will be important for us to think very deeply about also 
thinking about why is this like that? I think obviously it is linked also to the political economy of knowledge, but it is also linked to our own consciousness, the way we have been trained. Uh, and I, I thought also, immediately I was thinking about that. I thought in the 1960s and the 1970s, there were possibilities of theory coming from Africa, both theory and the empirical work being done from Africa. And the, you can, you can criticize the concept of neo-colonialism produced by Krumah, but he produced it within that context. Uh, it was only in the 80s, uh, 1990s, where there was re-subordination again, when the centers of Ipatan, the centers in Dakar, the centers in Maputo, they were all now suffocated because of the, 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 the major crisis which affected the higher education. Uh, but I think still there is, possibility to read theory from Africa. And there, is, there are a lot of theoretical concepts from Africa. I always talk about the concept of hybridity, which is always given credit to, to, <clears throat> to Homi Baba. That, but it is there, there is a long standing tradition of thinking about hybridity in African studies, beginning with the work of Edward Wilmot Blyden in 1887. Uh, coming to Kwame Nkrumah on consciences in 1964, and uh, coming to the work of uh, Al-Mazuri in 1986, uh, the triple heritage. So you can see it is, it is there, and it is a theory which we can use. So I'm just using that as an example. And then the other issue, which I think is important, when I started, I talked about the plurality of Africa, how plural it is. And the, one of the pluralities is really the linguistic heritage of Africa. And the, we can't take all these easy corners of saying, no, English is now our language, French is now our language, and we abandon our own languages. I don't think that, that, is, the, that is the way to go. And, the, and again, all those who argue that way, they have a tendency to distort what Nguki, what Yongo is saying. They have a tendency to say Nguki is hostile to what he called colonial languages. But Nguki is not saying that. His argument is that he is concerned when the colonial languages replaces the languages which existed on the continent. And secondly, he is concerned about practical issues pertaining to children when they go to school, when they are quickly moved away from the mother tongue. And he is saying that it disturbs the normal cognitive process. And he also talks about language, that, but when you take language, don't think about language as mere communication. It carries uh, so many things. It is the bank of memory, it is the career of culture, identity, and consciousness. And he became even more vocal during the time of the African Renaissance, when he was arguing that, is African Renaissance possible when the keepers of memory have to work outside their own linguistic memory? And uh, again, he has a new book now, uh, which is published this year, uh, The Language of Languages, where he is turning to the question of, uh, of translation as the language of languages. That in order to connect with other languages, I think the best mode would be translations, not remove and replace. Uh, then the fifth question which troubled me, and this one, it comes also from my own background as a historian is the question of the question of time, the question of chronology, and the question of prioritization in African studies. And that one also, uh, you know, Alu Mazuri said, Europe timed the world so that the Greenwich Meridian chimed with the universal hour. And uh, he was really beginning to talk about coloniality of time. But what is even more important is why is it that in African studies were working with pre-colonial, colonial, and the post-colonial interludes, with the colonial as, as a central determining center. And it is Kwesi Prao who say possibly the single most disastrous epistemic effect of colonial tutelage and experience on our thinking and education, which nomothetically and systematically straight jacket our basic assumptions along intellectually colonial and neo-colonial lines is the historical periodization scheme, which runs from pre-colonial, colonial, and the post-colonial period. And then uh, the Congolese historian, 
Jacques Depelchin also raises this issue that this periodization is a, is a, is a, is a, is a technique of silence. And the, if you, you read the work of Jacques Depelchin, Silences in African History, she raises very interesting arguments about that there was a time when African history was denied existence, that it never existed, right up to the 1960s. And he calls that the paradigm of, of denial. And then from 1960s, the paradigm of recognition. And he says, you can celebrate the other. And they, he says, but they, they carry the same logic. By the time they recognize African history as a legitimate disciplinary uh, area of study, it has been defined in accordance with the periodization of European history. That's what he's saying. So I think it is also important to think about this, this, this question of chronology in African studies. Of course, I don't have an answer of how to do it, uh, but I know that it preoccupied even the historians who were engaged in the UNESCO General History of Africa. They seem, not, they seem not to have succeeded in cracking it, but it must still preoccupy our research. Then the, the sixth issue, which I think is also important, we always talk about the issue of area studies uh, as, as defined in terms of the US using Africa, uh, African studies to understand these hunting grounds on the continent. But we don't also think about the problem of us as African scholars, each studying where you were born, <laughs> every time you are studying where you were born, and, the, and the, that we need to also think about it. And I think Mam, uh, Mahmoud Mamdan was beginning to, to think that way when he was saying the one of the major problems is notion that every expert must cultivate his or her own local patch where geography is forever fixed by contemporary boundaries. And he went on to call this the intellectual claustrophobia, in which state boundaries are conflicted with boundaries of knowledge and they consequently turning political into epistemological boundaries. So this issue is not about just pasting boundaries, it's also to make sure that African scholars need to understand Africa itself beyond where they were born. So it's, it's important that we, 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 we think that way as well. If we are, we, are, we, are, we are arguing about the fall of the area studies, we also need to rethink about this issue, it doesn't mean that it is wrong to begin from where you were born, but you must not end there. You need to, 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 to move beyond that. And uh, this affected me personally because where I was trained, there was a tendency that when you come into history, you are asked, where do you come from? <laughs> then you say this region, this region. Yeah, your topic must be, <laughs> must be there. <laughs> If you say I come from this region, this is your topic must be there. So it really reproduced the ethnicity in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a particular way. <clears throat> uh, and also this issue of thinking about Africa is because some of the, the, the thinkers from political science they think the solution is comparative African studies. And we did a paper myself, uh, this man and the and the and the, and the Vogue William on, on 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 a critique of the comparative African studies. But I think Odanga also raises another important area, which we need to think about. This idea that nowadays you find the fashion Africa, China, Africa, Brazil, Africa, India, Africa, whereby a continent is linked with a country. So the person is thinking that Africa is a country. He takes India as a country, but he says India, Africa. But India has relations with Zimbabwe, has different relations with different countries. It can't have a relations with the continent. How will you have something like that? But the idea that you are thinking about Africa as a country, it becomes the problem also, which actually indicates that in comparative studies, if you are not careful, you'll be reproducing the same colonialities which are carried in the knowledge. So that's one thing which I wanted to raise. Then of course, the question of androcentric question in African studies, it made me to, to return to that foundational text uh, in gendering African studies where there is a clear argument that 
if indeed is true that the majority, more than half, half of the humanity is of female and genders, this fact alone gives sufficient ground uh, <clears throat> that any social science which ignores such a percentage is actually an impoverished science. And this comes from Pan-Africanist feminists who were actually part and parcel of Cortesria. And they were actually explaining to themselves and to the colleagues that it would be important for us to take the question of gender seriously. And in the actual paper which I wrote, I really uh, said a number of things about this book because it is very important in the sense, in the way it was packaged and curated. If you go to it, then you will understand that the issue of gender analysis, the issue of feminist analysis is not something which you need to add or to think about after you've written, oh, I didn't mention women in school as then you add one or two. Personally, I would prefer to ignore them than to actually make an opportunistic way of just mentioning two. And then if they ask me, I will say, e.g., this one and that one. It must be actually something which we create we inbuilt it into our methodologies, into our epistemologies, into our theoretical thinking. And I think it will actually, and the issue is not that we are making any favor to anybody, but it, as they say, it will improve the quality of social science and it will improve the quality of African, doing African studies. So I think, I think it is important that we take it serious. Then eight, I'm about to end, is the question also of the, of the disciplines. Personally, I was trained in a discipline. I was trained in, in, in history. Okay. So I can't then claim that I was trained in African studies. It is only when I get out of the continent, out of Africa, that the legally topic which I did in Zimbabwe becomes African studies. <laughs> and I think it, it will be important to, to rethink that. But what also is important for me is a, African studies really, we tend to pull from, from disciplines. This is why I, I, I gave you the example of SE and the rivulets. And I, after I had written the paper, I then read one paper which was written by Paul Tiambezeleza, where he had various metaphors of African studies. Sometimes it is seen as marriage, sometimes as the sea, the sea is there already. And the issue is, when I came here, compared to South Africa, I found here there is strong belief in disciplines. There is, there is a strong belief in disciplines. And it reminded me really of uh, Louis Ara Gordon, this idea that we must be careful of what we call disciplinary decadence. The ontologizing or reification of a discipline, treating it as though it was never born and it has always existed and they will never change, or in some cases, it will never die. Even where we meet to try to do a courses on, uh, on African studies, it looks like everyone comes carrying his own discipline into that. <laughs> they come, it's just a historian comes to do history and anthropologist comes to do anthropology. They, they, there is no, no, no intention really to, to, to move beyond what I've called the disciplinary fundamentalism. Uh, of course, it is very difficult for almost all of us, but I think it is a challenge which we need to take into account uh, how to think about it. Because it has implications also that, do we really exhaust all our energies in disciplinary debates? Or again, we go back, to the concerns of African studies, which are existential, epistemological, and about injustices. And the, I think also the issue of inter trans multidisciplinarity has not been successful in giving uh, African studies security as a field. And the problem is immediately you put pressure on me uh, and critique me on some of the things. I can easily withdraw and say, ah, you are right. I'm not African studies, I'm history. So I just go back to my, to, my, to my subject. No, 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 you are right. But as for me, remember I'm a historian. 
And that means that at any time, African studies can be an orphan. Anyone can abandon it <laughs> and go back to, 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 their, to their disciplines. Uh, then lastly, I was also concerned about the question of the canon and the, the, the colonial library question in African studies. And I think we need to also put our heads together for that one. Uh, Tony Morrison put it very well, canon building is empire building. Canon defense is national defense. Canon debate, whatever the terrain, nature and the range of criticism of history, of knowledge, of definition of language, the universality and the asiatic principles, sociology of art, the humanistic imagination is the clash of cultures and the all of interests are invested. And in the, in the book, which we are editing with the, with the Katharina Schramm, we actually focus also on the question of the canon. Uh, uh, and uh, undoing the canon is the section which which we we, we focused on, and I think it is important. And uh, the issue being that the canon at the moment is produced from the perspective of the Africanist enterprise, and it is produced by those non-African high priests of the discipline. And why is it like that? They have access to the most recognized presses. They have access to all those journals which are said to be international peer reviewed journals. So then they dominate that way. And I think it also links with the colonial library which sustains it. And the issue is there are African scholars who are already for a long time trying to break out of this. And they, I'm reading the work of uh, Toyn Falola, particularly uh, I will refer to a number of you to his idea of ritual archives, the auto-ethnography, as he continued to search for. And I want to conclude by saying, all I'm trying to do here, I've just made, drew a map of the issues which we need to take into account. Secondly, I tried to be sectoral in, in, in the issues which I mapped out. But uh, the bottom line, was to provoke thinking, rethinking, and unthinking of African studies as part and parcel of advancing the agenda of reconfiguring African studies. And secondly, I wanted also, of course, to identify the domains in which we can practically intervene. And uh, of course, if anything, I was also attempting to say there is need to redefine and reconceptualize African studies, linking it with Black, African, Afro-feminist struggles as a field born of struggles. And of course, if anything, if I raised more questions than answers, let it be. Rethinking, thinking, and unthinking is always through questions. But what I think I also did, I was thinking along with African scholars who are thinking from Africa. Thank you so much. Can I, can I? No, <laughs> he wanted to run away, but I didn't let him. Uh, I think we still have time for questions. Um, we just need to find the uh, microphone. Are there any questions that anyone would like to pose? Yes, please. I'll just find questions. Uh, thank you, Kajeni, for the thought-provoking uh, presentation that you've given us. Uh, for me, I think my challenge is that, uh, I guess, when we're pointing at these different genealogies, for me, they seem to be doing different things. Uh, the Pan-Africanism 
genealogy versus the African studies genealogy. And again, as you said, you disaggregated it then very nicely and spoke about the area studies genealogy, which seems to be doing something very different. And when you go to the US and you go to the African studies conference, you'll only see Euro-Americans. You won't see African-Americans. And when you go to an African-American studies conference, you'll see only African-Americans. And so then it would come across as though the ones are not interested in issues of Africa than the others, but it's actually these issues of uh, compartmentalization and how they work in the field. So I also wanted to think about whether, for example, when you think about older uh, thinkers before our modern age, when you think of people like Augustine, Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine, and people like Tertullian and Euclid, all these people were African scholars in a way, but their writings were considered part of a Greek tradition, a Roman tradition, et cetera. Or whether we want to even think of people like even Batuta you spoke about, or people like Ibn Sina, who one might consider part of an Islamic age. So I, I, I think about whether this preoccupation on Africa, when the methods and tools that we are actually using are in fact of a Western tradition. And as, 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 as though, and that Africans find themselves in a political impasse because we cannot risk isolationism because isolationism would mean that we're excluded from the peer re review mechanisms and accesses to the libraries that you mentioned that give us access to a global movement of, of thought and ideas. And so I wonder if uh, African reconfiguring African studies uh, has a risk to it of, of something that we as, as Africans are not yet willing to undergo. That's my comment. Question. Maybe I take about three or so questions. Thanks a lot for the nice presentation. I know, I know if you say your name, please. Okay, my name is Festus Boama. I am from the Share of Social and Population Geography. Um, and my question is related to the, the, the 10 list, the list of 10 factors that are um, um, presenting challenges to the reconfiguration of African studies. I didn't see, um, or where will you, place in institutional challenges and the politics of consensus science, where whenever there's funding, uh, you see the people working on the project are socialized to agree on the scope of the research. And even though they disagree, because of the research funding conditionalities, they have to now uh, agree on things the under normal circumstances will not agree. And the key um, issue there is, for example, in the early 2000s when migration research, when the, there was funding provided, the researchers are told to work on how to reduce migration. So first of all, there's a epistemic challenge there. The outcome of the research has been determined in advance. And just to receive the funding, the researchers have to agree and work within that scope. I didn't see such a consideration in the 10 list you provided there. Okay, that's my question. My name is uh, Isaac. I'm a junior research uh, fellow. I, I want to clarify this issue of theory and empiricism that you raised. I mean, are you theory and empiricism that you talked about? Okay. 
are you on, uh, I mean, are you suggesting an all out war on theory from elsewhere? Why I ask that is because uh, you might have an idea. I mean, you're investigating something for which you find theory elsewhere outside Africa, which better explains the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I spent months trying to, I had a, a brief conversation with you sometime about the issue of financial technologies. And there are theories that are developed in Europe and in the US, which I think helps me to understand the, the problem occurring in Ghana and elsewhere. Is there something inherently wrong with this? Hmm. I mean. Let, let me try to, you can hear me. Let me start with you, Isaac. <clears throat> of course, I'm not all out war <laughs> on a theory from other places. Um, what we're trying to do is to pursue this issue of reconfiguring African studies uh, in such a way that what does it mean to bring Africa into African studies? It means their concepts, their theories need to come in. Um, if you arrive, the question is how do you arrive at a theory? I think that's, that's, that's the fundamental question which we need to. If you arrive at a theory, uh, not this one of saying I was moving in the library, then I met Foucault, then I saw that he is relevant to my work. That, that is not a rival at a theory. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that let's not create a lie that there are no theories and a concept in Africa. Let's, let's not create that lie. Uh, but that does not therefore preclude you from using other theories. Even myself, I use some of them from, from, from Europe. Uh, depending, the issue is when it becomes habitual that the, the data you go and collect in Africa, the data you go and collect in Asia, the data you go and collect in Latin America, the data you go and collect in Caribbean, then the theory you begin, oh, Europe and the North America. If we are doing that, we are still reproducing something very dangerous. So, so basically, I'm not I like that word all out war in <laughs> theory from elsewhere. That's not what that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm trying to to say before the world takes us serious, we must take ourselves serious in the first instance. And that's, that, that is the basic underlining issue. And, the, and, the, and the, if we have all these universities and the, all these professors, I don't think we can create a lie that a big country like Nigeria like that, there are no theories which we can use to understand why Muslim families send their children to Western schools. I don't think we can need to go to France to look for Bonjour for that. I, I don't think so. There is, there is a lot of scholarship which has been produced within the continent which can answer that very easily, which can frame that even more relevant. Uh, then my brother there who's raising, this is the problem about numbers. <laughs> Immediately I said 10, I knew they, it would be 11, 12, 13, 14. <laughs> Even when I was writing myself, I, I, I wanted to add more, but I said, let me stop here. I promised 10, let me stick to 10. But to the issue of institutional challenges, I thought I will avoid it, particularly if I was thinking about the, the reconfiguring here, because it looks like it's part and parcel of um, structural changes, which I said I will avoid for now and then move into the conceptual issues. But uh, I think it's an, important, it's an important aspect to look at. Then the question of a consensus, even if I'm raising these 10, I'm still very conscious that to produce critical knowledge, it is not about consensus per se. 
it is the pursuit of knowledge obviously leads to dissensus. But the dissensus must not be a ingenious dissensus. It must be dissensus really on issues. And you remember the, the critique which the, the philosopher Pauline Untonji put about African philosophy to say, but if it is a unanimous thought, it is not philosophy. And we had almost a similar challenges when we're talking pushing more the agenda of decolonizing, particularly when we're in South Africa, pushing the issue of decolonizing within universities. Let's decolonize that, let's decolonize that. And I was in an office where I was really the, the commissar to do that, if I can put it that way. And whenever I went to the departments, I never expected people, all of them to say, yes, let's do it this way. In a university, once you see people agreeing on one thing, you have actually destroyed it. So the issue is, we, we work through dissensus, but there are some issues which are actually existential, which affect other people. You can't say sexual harassment, I know is fine, other people believe is fine, others don't believe is fine. Those ones, we need a consensus on such issues. Um, then the, it's great that we have also brought another genealogy <laughs> going as far back as I said, Augustine, the Greek, and it is, it is my wish that in the research which we do in African studies, we dig as much in terms of genealogies going there. And it, through that, is not really being preoccupied about genealogies, is also being a cognizant that in order to reconfigure, in order to shift from the Eurocentric uh, genealogies, we need to find other genealogies for African studies. And the, and the, the issue that uh, when we do that, maybe we end up, and I, I raised it in, the, in one of the slides, I didn't read it, uh, when I was talking about uh, Mudimbe, there were a number of warnings. One is essentializing. Two is nativism. Three is what uh, Achille Bembe calls ghettoizing yourself. I'm, I'm not pushing for that. <laughs> I'm not pushing for Africa to cut itself from the world. Anyway, it's impossible. You can't cut it. It is already too, too implicated in world affairs of knowledge, uh, economy, and other things. But what I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to do is that the domain of African studies, and I'm not the only one, there are many others who are saying in the domain of African studies, but where are the Africans in African studies? And how do we put them, make sure that they are there at the center? I remember when, when we invited uh, uh, Dr. Godwin Murunga here, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm not about this issue of, of reconfiguring African studies. He said, I don't think, African. Then he, he ended up talking also about putting Africans at the center. And then somebody from the floor raised the question about the controversy which affected the African Studies Review Journal about ethno, what you call autoethnography. And he was saying, but this thing took place while Africans were there in the editorial board of the journal. So what do you mean by putting Africans at the center? And I think that question, we need to continue to, to define it. What do we mean by putting Africans at the center? If you put them in the editorial boards of these journals, which are which had gatekeepers, are they not being used to justify some of the dangerous decisions which are taken? So, so it's, it's, it's an important aspect, but I'm not really advocating for uh, the cutting of, of Africa from the world of knowledge. I remember it was uh, Ali Mazuri who raised it long ago, and they said, what we need to do when we're thinking about knowledge in Africa, we must be careful to be suspicious of the state, one, but we must connect the knowledge to society, two, but at the same time, we must not deconnect ourselves from the world of knowledge production. So he put it in such a 
in such an interesting way. And even in 1963, when Julius Nyerere became the first black uh, chancellor of the University of East Africa, uh, which Makerere, uh, uh, what, what, what is the other one in Kenya, and, and the Dar es Salaam, he also worried about this question which you are raising, the question of localizing, but at the same time, without necessarily avoiding what they call standards. He talked about the standards. How do we do it in such a way that we don't end up saying there are no standards? Uh, like they, 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 they are some people who are more radical than me. I don't want to hear the word standard. I don't want to hear the word uh, excellency. Immediately you raise that, they raise the flag of coloniality. But there is no civilization without its own standards of what is good and what is bad. I think we had one more question around the top. Um, Excellent, one more. One more, yes. <laughs> Right the top. That's almost yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, um, that was a great talk. Uh, I'm Muda, by the way, I'm a student here. Um, I was wondering, Professor, that if someone is not in basically based in global south and living uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global north and train in the global north, can that person play a role to give a voice to the voiceless? So give back agency who have been denied agencies for long. So is it, is it possible? That's an important question which is posed many times. Uh, and uh, I think it is an important question which we need to, to pay attention to. Um, I think when we're talking about the global south, I think we don't mean a geography per se. As, as those who are more complex than me, they say there is a global north in the global south. There is a global south in the global north. So they are talking about global south to mean not geography per se, uh, maybe positionality in the power structures. Uh, that would be one dimension. But uh, I think the work of uh, of Ramon Grossfokel helped us to really think about that question which we are raising. Because he raises the question of, don't confuse geographical location with the epistemic location with the social location. So he says, don't confuse those three. And they, if you confuse them, then you will create an impression that all of those who are based in Africa, they produce decolonized knowledge. That is not true. There are so many Eurocentric thinkers in Africa who are more Eurocentric than Europeans. So, so it's, it's really, we need to be critical when we're thinking about this issue of, uh, and then you have people like Bonaventura Tissot Santos, who is from Portugal, but he has been pushing the agenda of epistemologies of the global South, even if he's a European. Of course, as a Southern European, Southern Europeans have their own issues, which made him to think the way he is thinking. But at least it shows that it is not about where you are located geographically, which makes you think critically about issues of power in knowledge, about issues of politics in knowledge, about issues of locus of enunciation in knowledge. So my simple answer is you can be based wherever you are based, do progressive work. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's fine. I think they just want to, yeah, it's fine. Me first or you? <laughs> I would just like to say thank you very much. Yes, you can go sit down. <laughs> mm.
Yeah, so uh, I also want to add a short word of thanks, first of all, to uh, to this great audience in the room and in the Zoom. And I would also like to acknowledge Liana Vizotsky, who has uh, done a lot of work to prepare this event. Uh, and uh, of course, our master of ceremonies, uh, Dr. Anke Schiveris. Thank you so much. I think she has deserved an applause. And um, Dr. Christine Vogt William for her fabulous introduction. And um, I have to make a confession. And I mean, Zabelo, of course, he knew who we was talking about when he said someone stole his holiday. It was me. <laughs> and um, I think whatever you delivered here uh, confirms that it was the right thing to do. So thank you so much, Zabelo, for this uh, really intriguing input that you gave us. And well, this is now the flowers for Liane Vizotsky. And uh, you have all seen that we have uh, prepared a reception outside and uh, you are all welcome uh, to socialize, discuss, uh, have a drink and have some finger food. Thank you so much for making this a great New Year lecture. <laughs>